If you've been following my channel at all, you may have seen that a while back we bought ourselves a Shapeoko CNC router, which was a great way to get started in the world of CNC. Well, a few months after that, I accidentally acquired another bigger CNC machine. And when I say it was an accident, I really mean that. It basically followed me home like a lost puppy on the back of a flatbed trailer that I borrowed. Well, ever since we got the new machine up and running, which did take considerable work, and I may do a video about that soon, the Shapeoko has been collecting dust in the corner, and we've been wondering what to do with it. Well, I recently had an idea, which might be a terrible idea, that we could turn it into a plasma cutter. Now there's a few things about the mechanics of the Shapeoko which are not great for use as a plasma cutter. One notable one being that all the axes are belt driven. You can imagine that rubber belts probably won't hold up very well to being bombarded with sparks and molten metal. But for now, let's talk about the bare minimum that we need to accomplish to make this thing function as a plasma cutter. So first we need to get ourselves an appropriate plasma machine, which I'll get into a little bit more later. And then we need to remove the router and replace it with our torch, which we have to find some way to strap to the Z-axis. Next we need to develop some sort of mechanism for our Shapeoko control board to turn the plasma machine on and off. And then finally we need to remove the spoil board and replace it with a surface that's more appropriate for cutting metal. There's a lot of other features that we could add that would make this machine safer and more functional. Things like a water bath or a live torch height controller. But we're doing the quick and dirty version for now with the idea that this is really just a learning experience and that maybe later on down the road we'll do a more serious build. The machine we're using is a 60 amp Everlast which cost about $1400. There are certainly cheaper plasma cutters that you could use, but this is the one place where I didn't want to skimp. I've been using this machine for manual cuts in the shop now for several months and it works great, but I chose this machine in particular because of some of the features it has that lend it well to use in CNC. For one thing, it doesn't use a high frequency start, which can wreak havoc on surrounding electronics, including your Shapeoko control board, but it also has this CNC mode which allows you to interface with the machine through this port in the back. It's got a 12 pin connector, which could provide support for a lot of useful features in a more sophisticated CNC machine. But for now, all we really care about are pins one and two, which are used to turn the machine on and off. So the first thing we need to do is crack open our Shapeoko's control board and find an output that we can hijack to trigger our plasma cutter. In the top right corner of the board, you'll see that there are two pens labeled ground and PWM. These are meant to be used with an optional speed controller for a router, but they'll work just fine for us. I'm just going to solder in this little four pin connector so we can tap in as needed and then we'll put this thing back together. So now we're just going to run a little simulation to see if this all works in the way that I think it's supposed to. So I've got my Raspberry Pi here, which is running my cam software, connected to the Shapeoko control board. And I'm going to run some G-code on this that will send instructions to the Shapeoko control board telling it that it's cutting a circle out. Uh, obviously we're not connected to any of the stepper motors so nothing is really going to move. It's just going to show a little dot move here on the screen. After it thinks it's done with its lead-in movements, the PWM pin should send 5 volts here to the breadboard, which should cause my relay to switch, closing the circuit on these two leads that are connected to my ohm meter. It may be hard for you to see the little dot that indicates the X and Y positions of the cutter, but as it approaches the beginning of the circle, the relay switches and my ohm meter shows that the circuit is closed. Well, since our simulation went pretty much as expected, we're going to go ahead and make up a more permanent circuit board, and we're going to add in a few extra features, like this LED indicator light, which might help us later on down the road if we have to troubleshoot some problems. So on our circuit, we have five volts coming in from our control board, and then we have a 220 ohm resistor and an LED as an indicator light. After that, we have a relay, which is closing a circuit between pins one and two. 
You'll notice that off to the side there's also a limit switch. This is part of a breakaway holder for our torch that's a safety feature I'll get into a little bit more later. While I'm finishing this up, Rob is at the other end of the table soldering leads to a 12 pin connector. Even though we're only using two of the leads for now, we'd like to have the option later to add things like a torch height controller. I know this conduit box is kind of an unusual choice for a housing for our electronics, but I'm trying to do as much of this as possible with stuff I just had lying around the shop. Now that we've got that squared away, we can start building our cutting surface. The first thing I'm doing is removing this center bracket, which is going to greatly reduce the rigidity of our machine, but for plasma cutting that's not really going to be an issue. The torch head should never actually come in contact with anything, so there are no side loads to deal with. It just kind of floats above your work and spits out some kind of witchcraft that cuts metal. We decided to also cut back the width of the side rails, which is again going to reduce the rigidity of the machine. However, I think that we're going to regain some of that when we drop in the work surface that we're building. Assembling the cutting surface turned out to be the hardest, or at least the most annoying part of this build. Primarily because I don't have a flat surface to work on. My welding table is badly warped in the middle, but after a lot of shimming and welding and then re-welding, we managed to get a pretty flat surface. This is important because the torch head needs to remain less than an eighth of an inch above the top of your work, and without having a torch height controller, any variation in flatness could lead to a bad cut or a crash that could potentially damage something. Typically a plasma table has removable slats that just kind of drop into place so that you can take them out as they get damaged. We decided to just tack weld these in and if we need to remove them later to chip away some slag we'll just grind the tack welds off. This is just a solution that we're using for our quick and dirty version of the build and later on we'll probably come up with a better system that includes a water bath. In anticipation of the very likely event that we do screw up and crash our torch into something, we're building our holder with a breakaway feature. This is basically going to consist of two plates that are keyed together and held with a magnet. There will be a limit switch in between them that will shut the torch down if it shifts out of position. sure it's strong enough. So I think maybe just put some on there. Make sure you stay well away from the uh, mechanism side. Yep. 
Well, I think we're about ready to do a dry run. We've got our circuit board here ready to turn the plasma cutter on and off. We've got our torch head elegantly poised here with a couple of hose clamps holding it in. And we've got this janky hook up here keeping the whip out of the way. And then we've got our Raspberry Pi here set up with the cam software. Let's see what it does. I would say that was a pretty successful operation. The cut came out really clean on top. It does have a little bit of a kind of angle beneath the top, but I think that that was mostly caused by the tip we were using on our plasma cutter. It had already been through some abuse and it probably was time to change it out. Uh, this is the first time I've generated G-code for any plasma cutter, so I've still got some learning to do in that regard. So I think we've definitively answered the question of whether or not you can turn your shape oko into a plasma cutter. But the more important question is probably, does it make sense to do so? And the answer for most people is probably no. Unless you just happen to have one lying around and nothing to do with it, it just makes more sense to buy the components you need that are more specialized for plasma cutting. But anyway, we had fun doing it and I think we're gonna get some pretty good cuts out of it, at least until a piece of molten metal destroys our belts. Thanks for watching.